Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we're now for worship on a beautiful rainy day. All the farmers are happy and uh, the seeds are growing and God is being good to us. Um, we did not start on time for the radio because the radio is not up and running. So uh, I'm beginning to start now. So I thought we'll start now. Uh, it is the fifth, yep, fifth Sunday of Easter. So you still have to be ready at any time to say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And we are truly blessed to be in God's house. So he's going to be here in a special way, his body and blood, in with another the bread and wine to bless us today. And we're also going to talk about some new and improved things uh, as we go through uh, the sermon this morning. Uh, order of service is from Divine Service Setting 1 for the month of May. And uh, I don't think there's anything special. I, I'll dare not say it's a normal Sunday. I know it happens when that happens. Uh, but uh, we are blessed always to be in God's presence when we're in His house, and we ask for His blessings on our time with a word of prayer. So let's pray. Dear God, Heavenly Father, each day is a gift from You. We cherish today to worship You, uh, to remember Your resurrection, to uh, also be blessed by Your gifts through Your word and sacraments. Uh, you feed us and You sustain us, that we can go out and uh, Share the love that you've given each of us. We ask for your blessings as your Holy Spirit is in our midst. That you watch, that we worship you in spirit and truth. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is hymn number 906, O Day of Rest and Gladness. So we'll stand for the last verse. O come, let's worship the Lord. <coughs>
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for you, and for His sake forgives you all your sins. As a call and ordained servant of Christ, and by His authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The intro for today is, we'll read responsibly. O sing to the Lord a new song, for He has done marvelous things. His right hand. The Lord has made known His salvation. Oh, sing! Let's do it that way. He has remembered His steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Bring forth into joy a song. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre. With the lyre and the sound of melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son. And to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning. It is now and will be forever. Amen. O sing to the Lord a new song. For He has done marvelous things. We continue with the Kyrie. Let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, you make the minds of your faithful to be of one will. Grant that we may love what you have commanded and desire what you promise. That among the many changes of this world, our hearts may be fixed where true joys are found. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. First reading is from Acts 11, 1 through 18. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying, You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them? But Peter began and explained it to them in order. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. Something like a great sheet descending, being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to me. Looking at it closely, I observed animals and beasts of prey and reptiles and birds of the air. And I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, By no means, Lord, for nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But the voice answered a second time from heaven, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and all was drawn up again into heaven. And behold, at that very moment, three men arrived at the house in which we were sent to me from Caesarea, and the Spirit told me to go with them, making no distinction. These six brothers also accompanied me, and we entered the man's house. And he told us how he had seen the angel stand in his house and say, Send to Joppa and bring Simon, who is called Peter. He will declare to you a message by which you will be saved, you and all your household. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them, just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us, when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I that I could stand in God's way? When they heard these things, they fell silent, and they glorified God, saying, Then to the Gentiles also God has granted repentance that leads to life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We read responsibly the gradual for the season. Christ is risen from the dead. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. The epistle reading is from Revelation 21, 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is the word of the Lord. I'd like you to please stand for reading the Holy Gospel. We sing the Alleluia in verse. <laughs>
Gospel according to St. John, the 16th chapter. Jesus said, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. A little while, and you will see me no longer. And again a little while, and you will see me. So some of his disciples said to one another, What is this that he says to us, A little while, and you will not see me. And again a little while, and you will see me. And because I am going to the Father. So they were saying, What does he mean by a little while? We do not know what he is talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him, so he said to them, Is this what you are asking yourselves? What I meant by saying, A little while, and you will not see me, and again, a little while, and you will see me? Truly, truly, I say to you, You will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice. You will be sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn into joy. When a woman is giving birth, she has sorrow because her hour has come, but when she has delivered the baby... She no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. So also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for next hymn. Hallelujah. Let praises ring.
God's great mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for proclamation this morning is the alternate gospel reading for this Sunday from John chapter 13 verses 31 through 35, which I'll read for you now. When he was gone, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself, and will glorify him at once. My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. This is the word. Name of Jesus, dear Christian friends. The theme for the message this morning is new and improved. <clears throat> Pardon me. I don't know how many of you have been to a store recently and seen something repackaged. I had the awful experience of being in. The, well, I was a wonderful experience being in St. Paul, Minnesota, at my daughter-in-law's graduation last Saturday. But in traveling there, you have to stop for gas and get snacks and. And one of my vices is uh, uh, snowballs. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, those little cake things, you know, those marshmallow on them and coconut. And I found that they, in, at least in Minnesota, had a, a new and improved version. They were smaller, <laughs> but for the same price. So I was a little disappointed. I was excited to have some snowballs, but they were a lot smaller than I expected. And uh, yet they still tasted good. But you know, we see this all the time in commercials, right? In terms of new and improved, uh, it could be from toothpaste to automobiles. There's some new, something special put in a toothpaste to make your, your teeth even shine more than usual. Or you got to have that new automobile, it has that new certain thing it can do that no other car could do. Um, the idea that a product is new and better can be a powerfully appealing prospect. Now, to suggest that something is new may not necessarily mean that the same, that some version of the product did not exist before. In fact, including the word improved would seem to indicate that whatever the product is, it did exist in some form before, but maybe it wasn't so good, so they needed to make it better. And so now they're going to give you a better product that you just got to have. And of course, it'll cost you a little bit more to have, too. So whether it's true or not, they can put that on the the packaging, right? Uh, The image created, though, can be a compelling selling point, something we want or need, and possibly something we have bought before is now so improved that it is a totally new product. Now, of course, in our text, Jesus does not say to his disciples that he's giving them a new and improved commandment. He merely says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. However, it's hard not to hear an implied improved in Jesus' words. We can observe Jesus in his ministry as a subtle, and sometimes not so subtle, critique of legalism. Jesus seems to speak directly, attack the purity laws that render people clean and unclean. So we got separate people. And if you're in the unclean group, you can't get close to God. And it was very difficult. We heard that in our epistle lesson, our first lesson from uh, hearing St. Peter being told that all foods are okay now uh, because some foods would make you unclean. And, of course, all our hog farmers are happy about that uh, because they're now things that we can have. And I certainly love a good bacon. But it implies that God is opposed to them you know, if they were part of the unclean group. The unclean exist in a state of perpetual judgment and alienation. So Jesus offers a new and improved way of relating to God. We do not earn our standing with God on the basis of ritual purity laws. We receive our standing with God because of God's own grace. We are loved by God regardless of our situation. We are embraced by God's love even before we know it exists. 
We are pursued by God's goodness. So Jesus models this in his own actions. He heals lepers, touches them. You're not even supposed to get close to them. He eats with sinners. Well, at least I could eat with them then, right? Hopefully the rest of us too. He engages in conversation with Samaritans, foreigners, and Gentile women. All those whom ritual purity laws would label untouchable. And if you got close to them, you couldn't go to the temple that week. You'd have to go through a a cleaning process before you could go back to the temple. So he truly is the incarnation of the great summary of the good news found in John's gospel. For God so loved the world. Now we might pause at this point and ask ourselves, if Jesus is really being realistic, you know, can anyone really be ordered, commanded, to love someone else? It's one of the favorite theolog- theological points I got out of the movie uh, Bruce Almighty. <laughs> you know, uh, Jim Carrey's character wants to make his girlfriend love him. And Morgan Freeman says, yeah, that's the frustration. I want my people to love me as God, and they can't. They won't. I can't make them. Uh, You can't make someone love you. And that's really the point. You can't command someone to love someone else. Isn't love something that must flow freely from the heart? Can love be a command, new or improved or not? Well, to answer this question, is, is it is necessary to understand the word command what it would have meant to a first century Jew. It's not appropriate for us to insert our own understanding of the word into this conversation. It is necessary to hear what Jesus' followers would have heard. And any time a discussion of the law and the commandments was on the table, first century Jewish people would have heard the word Torah. Torah refers to the first five books of the Old Testament. In particular, the words that were given to Moses by God as part of the covenant God made with the Israelites when he created the Israelites. Now true, the most common translation of the word Torah is law. But to understand how the people of Israel would have heard that word, we need to consider using another word. Instead of law, a better word might be instruction or wisdom. What God was offering to the people of Israel in the terms of the covenant with Moses was not a rigid set of rules to keep, though they were eventually interpreted that way. Rather, God was offering a more excellent way to live. And if you remember the context of the giving of the Ten Commandments, it's right after they got out of Egypt. And, you know, God, Jesus, you know, through Moses, God gives these commandments to the people these ways of living saying if you love me you'll do these things and they said of course we will you got us out of egypt things are going to be great even though we're going to have to wander around for 40 years but we're going to have these these commandments they're not as rules to make our lives worse you know they're not fun sucking rules that make things terrible they're actually there for our protection they're there to make our relationship with god better and that's why he has these rules, these commandments, these words of the Torah. There are a set of values, a deep wisdom about human nature that if embraced and embodied, have the power to tr- transform human existence. And it's in this sense that Jesus speaks of a new commandment. Jesus takes Torah, the wisdom of God, that makes us whole, and distills it down to one simple instruction. Now, the old law of Moses can be expressed in one simple, new, and approved piece of wisdom. If we can make loving one another our guiding principle, our core value, it will transform everything. Now, of course, the case can be made that Jesus is not really saying to love everybody. The word he uses, if taken narrow and literally, could be interpreted to mean love those who are in your group. Sociologists have long noted that the feelings of fear and anxiety that exist when a tight-knit group encounters other groups it is the fear and distrust of the other that is the basis for racial and other forms of prejudice. And I certainly felt that 
uncomfortableness last uh, weekend in St. Paul. St. Paul is very different than Seward, Nebraska, if you've ever noticed. Uh, I think they had 35 different countries represented in the class that graduated from Concordia, St. Paul. Um, it was very, you know, we had Muslims, we had different colors, we had uh, different economic groups, there was a different neighborhood. Uh, that's not what I'm used to. I like your little town of 3,800 people uh, where you pretty much know everybody. Uh, it's a good thing to do. But when you're out of that comfort zone, how are you going to react? What are you going to do? It is difficult to imagine that Jesus is promoting a sort of theological tribalism. His own actions seem to contradict such an idea, and his use of the image of the great commandment in other places also contradicts the notion that Jesus is suggesting we love only the group we are in. However, there may be some wisdom to the notion that we must love the group we are in before it's possible to love the group that we are not in. This is especially true in modern churches in bigger cities, right? Many congregations there comprise the people who literally come from everywhere. The days when churches were made up mostly of family members have become the exception rather than the norm. And demonstrating to ourselves and others that we are capable of loving those who are different from us may create pathways that lead us to love the other one truly. So what is love? The final piece of all this requires that we carefully define what is meant by the word love. Modern culture uses love in so many ways that the word, if we're not careful, can become meaningless. And I think you've heard me talk about that before too. We use the word love uh, in an almost abusive way in terms of, you know, I love my dog, I love my mom, I love my wife, I love the Huskers. You know, all these different things that we love... You know, we use the word love, but they don't mean the same. Um, you know, like you said, I love uh, snowballs, even if they are in smaller size. Um, you know, we love our grandmas, and we love our cars, and that piece of land we live on, and so forth. And saying that Jesus has made love the centerpiece of the way of life requires that we carefully define and understand what the word means. The Greek word that's used here, they had three words for love in the Greek language, and the word used here is agape. And we're familiar with this word, and usually sum it up by my saying it refers to unconditional love, a God-like love, a love that would make you think of someone else other than yourself. But unconditional love is very difficult to achieve. You think about any time you have a breakdown in a relationship, how does that happen? Because someone chose to be selfish. I'm not going to love unconditionally anymore. Gone too far. This one I'm going to hold on to. I'm not going to give that up. So it seems that's very, a, a pretty difficult to achieve, unconditional love. Almost all of our relationships, both within group people and without group people, exist in some sort of conditional situations. To say that we are going to love unconditionally as a way of life, is really an exercise in self-delusion. We can't do it as imperfect human beings. Far better is to divine agape as an ethical practice so that the focus is on our behavior rather than our feelings. I think that's really important with the word love. You know, uh, if you were to do pre-marriage counseling with me, uh, one of the things I would tell you is, Love is more than just a feeling. Love is a decision. You're deciding to get married. You may not love that person all the time, or may not like that person all the time, but your decision to love is of something you've committed yourself to do till death do us part. Uh, that's based on behavior. Then your behavior reflects that, not just when I feel in love, I decide to love because God first loved me. In fact, that is the first thing that must be said about this kind of love. The love that Jesus suggests as a foundation for a faithful life does not necessarily involve feelings. The distinction can be made this way. It is possible to love a person with agape love and not particularly like that person. Wow, that's kind of a strong statement, isn't it? I love you like Jesus does, but I don't like you. 
I'm not going to invite you over to play cards. You know? Uh, and, and we're not commanded to like, but we are commanded to love. So show respect and, res- and kindness to that person, speak well of them. That's all that's included in there, but we don't have to like that person. Our emotionally charged understanding of love makes it hard to imagine such a thing, but that is the nature of the meaning of this word. Of course, caring for someone, acting toward him or her with this kind of love may lead to feelings of mutual affection. You know, God can create feelings for you that you didn't think you'd have for that person that you thought was such a horrible person, but you still had to love them because they went to your church. Now, of course, uh, what happens is not, uh, uh, or what happens or not is of no consequence to the functional meaning of the word. To love someone with agape love means that we act in the best interests of that person. That we think more of them and we think what's best for them, regardless of how I feel about them. Because my feelings are important. How God feels about them, that's really important. And we know how much God loves them, right? He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. Christ is risen. Hallelujah. So knowing that about how God feels about that other person, because I know how he feels about me, changes how I talk and act and treat that person, uh, to love them with agape love. Our actions, our dealings with people always have a goal of enriching and advancing the life of the other. Jesus' image of laying down our lives for another is a dramatic illustration of this concept. It's meant figuratively, of course. The idea is unmistakable, though. To love others means to always put their interests ahead of our own. Now, obviously, such idealistic behavior is risky. If you're going to love someone like that, you take the chance of getting burned. You know, they may not love you back. They may not treat you the way you're treating them. That is why there is wisdom in perfecting this approach to life with those with whom we share a community. Ideally, within this in-group, there will come to be a mutual and ongoing effort to love one another in a way that puts the interests of others ahead of our own. It's also as a community that we take this radical practice of love outside the boundaries of the in-group. If we can love ourselves with agape here, imagine what a difference it makes out there when they see how we love and how we love other people. That's what we are to do as a family of faith. It's also community that we take this radical practice of love outside the boundaries. This is not the work of lonely individuals. This is a calling to work of the whole church. Uh, You'll find that out in a little while when we get our vision statement out in front of you that got distilled from your surveys and and from your missioning event, you know, about being a compassionate, caring church, a family of people that care more about others than ourselves and care about worth, true worth in Christ. It's a love toward the world, it's it's to love the world, it is to love the world the way God loves the world, to see interests of others of others instead of our own. So whether we can actually change the world with love is a challenge yet to be proven. But yet it's a challenge we need to take. We need to take that risk to prove that because we know how much God loves us, I'm willing to risk and love someone else agape style. But we can be transformed, though, as individuals first, and we can live among fellow travelers who are transformed by this vision. That becomes a potent tool in our efforts to bring light to the world. And it explains why this is such an important new and improved commandment. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue our worship as we make confession of our Christian faith. In the words of the Nicene Creed, we confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and not made, being of one substance with the Father, 
by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended to heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please remain standing for the prayers of the church. Our prayer response this morning is, hear our prayer. Lord of heaven and earth, in the glorious resurrection of your son Jesus, you have given the promise of our own resurrection. As we await the last day, calm our hearts and strengthen our faith through our sorrows. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, you have fashioned the church as a heavenly bride for your risen Son. Grant her your spirit that she may always listen to his deathless voice and ever declare his message of salvation. Lord, in your mercy, gracious God, lead your people in your steadfast love and guide them in strength to your holy abode. Sanctify our homes. Be the companion of those who live alone and make all our household places in which your wisdom and grace are found. Lord, in your mercy, eternal Lord, you hold all people accountable for the responsibilities you have given them. O Lord, bless our president, our governor, the Congress and legislature, and all judges and magistrates. Guide them to serve according to your will and for the common good of all. Raise up those with heroic virtue who will defend our liberty. Protect those who defend us in the armed forces, even as you give peace to the nations. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O Alpha and Omega, you pledge to bring all things to their perfect consummation. You will bring heaven to earth and banish sorrow, sin, and death. Sustain all those who are in tribulation now. Uh, continue to be with our missionaries, Jen Englehart and Chelsea Irwin. Strengthen Levita Stanton. Comfort the family of Linnell Stoliker. Be with those who battle COVID. Be with Sidney Carlson. Be with those who are battling cancer, including those who recently were diagnosed with Karen Carlson, who was diagnosed with breast cancer, and with uh, Rachel Kalhoff, who was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Continue to be with others who battle cancer, including Nino Sommerfeld, Tracy Hedlund, Beth Martinson, Linda Rupert, Carolyn Stewart, Alan Bentz, Ann Koopman, Don Skopek, be with Don Skopek, Skopek as he's in your care, uh, be with Carolyn Hurt, Sandy Pete, and Mark Tin, and Julian Lichty. Be also with me and for my friend Ted, who is in hospice care now. Lord, hear these prayers for your comfort, and by the comfort of your holy word, increase their faith, and see them through their trials. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. compassionate Lord, you have given us both bread for the body and Christ, the bread of life. Prepare us now to receive with faith and thanksgiving his flesh for the life of the world, and his blood that, cause, that cleanses us from all sin. Unite us that we may believe and confess one faith, and bring us to that day when we shall be one people together at the table of our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. Lord of life, we ask you to bless those who have uh, birthdays in our congregation, be it Brock Eichelberger, Margaret Fuscher, Tyler Hepke, Paul Seeger, Ariel Jackson, and Angie Shecker. Bless these your servants with special days, the celebration, and you're blessed to your love. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we wait for the second coming of your resurrected Son. Grant us patience as we long to see him. And even now, give us joy at his presence with us through the word and sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. All these things, whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit. One God forever. Amen. Amen.
Please be seated. Normally at this time we'd collect the offerings. The offering plate is at the back of church there. Uh, we'll be bringing offerings forward here in a little bit. If you didn't get a chance to do that, there'll be an offering plate for you on the way out as well this morning. A few announcements. One that's really gotten my attention, Radar, VBS is early this year. I don't know if you guys have caught that. And it takes a lot of people to make VBS happen. So please get in touch with Olivia and um, both uh, sign up. Uh, one of the things, how, how close we are to showing that, Adam. One of the things that's happened this week is our website is live. I want to give special thanks to Jackie Meyer for helping support that project. I saw an edge of it. <laughs> there it is. ChristLutheranO'Neill.org. Uh, if you scroll down, uh, there's a place that you can actually sign up for VBS. Uh, register VBS right there on the left. Get that link and you can get to a, f- a form to do that. There's a way to contact us there. Um, also at the top, uh, if you go back to the top there, that thing with the cross in the middle with the a C and some L's and another C. That's uh, our new and improved logo uh, that was branded for our congregation. So that'll be on everything that we have uh, come out of our church. And so both between that, and that's a place to get you back to the homepage. But you can check out the rest of it. Uh, If you want to scare the mice out of your house, there's a picture of uh, the staff there uh, on the about part, I think you're... But go and check it out. Uh, enjoy, and we're thankful for all those who put it together, uh, especially Julie Meyer, uh, who is our webmaster, and we're going to have uh, uh, Jocelyn Vanderslice be our local person to help us keep the, the website up to date. So great reach, way to reach people, as well as stay communicate with, connected with one another with current events, sharing, God's, God's, sharing together God's word, Christ Lutheran, ChristLutheranO'Neill.org. Uh, other announcements? Neil. <clears throat> I invite, you, I invite you to come and join us this morning at Bible class. We are in the second part of chapter 11 in 1 Corinthians. Paul addresses the first the Corinthian congregation with the fact that some of them were getting sick, even sick unto death. The question is why? Come and find out. <laughs> Got a hook, good hook there, Neil, thank you. So in Bible class continues on... Uh, Tuesday mornings, uh, we're looking at a Jesus legend or legacy, uh, and also the ladies are meeting at noon. We're looking at He Chose the Nails uh, from Max Lucado. LD Mel is meeting this Tuesday evening at 7 o'clock. We'd love to have all of you there that would like to be part of that uh, time of fellowship and study of God's Word, too. Um, continue to need people to serve. If you're currently not serving in some position, a great way to be involved in the life of the congregation uh, is to help out, uh, whether it be through greeters or financial counters. Uh, there's many, many ways. I know they're always looking for people with Alter Guild. Um, again, not difficult work, but uh, essential work and to make sure that the communion is set up and colors for the Sundays are put up and all those things that you can do together with another person in fellowship. So uh, thankful for this month uh, that we got Tim Mann uh, serving as elder, that Ann Mann and Lene Hilker are on Alter Guild. That Teresa Chul is our chairperson. If we were to have a funeral, which uh, we will have uh, this coming Saturday for Linnell Stoliker. Um, we we'll also have greeters, Gene and Wendy Kelly and Steph Drukey. Uh, financial counters this month is uh, Gene and Wendy Kelly, and our ushers are Ron Crumley and Gene Kelly for the month. And we're blessed with an awesome group of organists. I always like to brag uh, to other pastors how blessed we are to have three organists. And not only uh, do we have three organists, we occasionally get a couple horns there. So thanks to Addison and Will for blessing our worship, too. It takes, uh, uh, Janet and I were talking. It takes pressure off of her because the horns really improve what she does. And then, of course, uh, it doesn't matter how good the sermon is because you got that good music uh, to be blessing you. So uh, we're thankful for those blessings in worship. Anything I forgot to remember? All righty, then. I invite you to please stand as the offerings are brought forward. And we sing the offertory, What Shall I Render to the Lord?
service of the sacrament beginning with the preface. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary. Should all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially, we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ the very Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By His dying, He has destroyed death, and by His rising again, He has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter and John, and with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify Your glorious name, evermore praising You and singing. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth, to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship, with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Amen. Father. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ took bread after supper, and when he gave him thanks, he broke it and gave disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Same, we also took the cup after supper, and when he gave him thanks, he gave it to him, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. <laughs>
blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep you in true faith to life everlasting. Go in peace and joy. Amen. I invite you to please stand as we sing our post communicanical Thank the Lord. God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh. We thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament. We ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Receive the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord will say shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please be seated for our closing hymn, Joyful, Joyful, we adore thee.